recognize the transformative role that entertainment, music, and the arts could play in the lives of our young people. It was removed from the hearse and positioned at the back of the gymnasium where it will repose until the start of the funeral service proper scheduled for 10.30 this morning. Between now and that time, you are invited to listen to tributes in poetry and song as we celebrate the life of Richard Stout, an individual who did a great deal for the young people of Barbados. Many would recall the annual Richard Stout Teen Talent Competition. And many individuals all across Barbados, especially those who live in the rural areas, leaving home as early as 10 a.m. on Sunday morning to take the bus down to the Queen's Park Steel Shed, where they hopefully would find a seat to be part of that competition. It is Friday, the 15th day of December in the year of our Lord, 2023 is the day on which Barbados says goodbye to Richard Stout. There is he, his grandson, Kevin Stout, paying his final respects to his grandfather. The grandson of Richard Stout, that is, Kevin's son. National cricket player, the son of Richard Stout, Kevin Stout, and the Brown. The late Richard Stout was born in Barbados on the 8th of January, 1946, in the parish of St. Michael. Like most Barbadians of that era, Richard Stout could have taken the opportunity to leave these shores, but instead, he recognized that there was a tremendous amount of work that needed to be done with the youth of Barbados. And he remained here and did that work. And yes, he did it well. He fared well in the arena for which he was called.
We are expecting the pre-service tributes to begin any moment now. And those pre-service tributes will be preceded by a reading. We are going to start with the pre-tributes. The first singer is a young lady over the last couple of years has been doing the stage management duties at the Richard Stout Teen Talent, um, a daughter to Richard, let's welcome out Rashida Codrington. If you give a little more than you take And if you try to fix more than you break If you're the kind who tells the time to help a stranger in the rain, There's a place for people like you if you walk around with your heart on your sleeve And if you try to change you want to see If you lay down your life, get sight to the ones who lost the way There's a place for people like you I've heard of the streets made of gold And when you get there There's a hand to hold I believe When your days down here are through There's a place up there For people like you if you walk around with your heart on your sleeve And if you try to be the change you want to see If you show a little love, give sight to the ones who lost the way There's a place for people like you made of gold and when you get there there's a hand to hold I believe when your days down here are through there's a place up there for people like you Ooh. For people like you, ooh, 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 ooh. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've heard up there the streets are made of gold, and when. 
There's a place up there for people like you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sleep well, sir. At this point, we want to pause because we get all team talent present and past contestants in the house stand, please. Please give them a round of applause. We want to thank you for your support and your attendance. Also present, we have members of BACA. Please stand. The president is Colin Spencer. Barbados Association of Creatives and Artists, we thank you for supporting us. Um, we are going to the screen now for video. Hey, my name is Shane Heavy, and I'm here being tribute to the life and legacy of Mr. Richard Stowe. Um, Mr. Stowe is a beacon of light to so many people, those who knew me personally and those who you know, interact with me. Um, I'm very grateful to him for taking me under his wing and molding me into the singer performer I am today. Even though that I'm a product of the disabled community, um, he never let that deter him from helping me in any way and making me feel welcome and included in anything related to the show. I want to say I'm very thankful and grateful for him. I am surely going to miss him, and, I'm, and I'm, I will be forever grateful for him being a part of my life. Come into rest in peace, sir. I'm sitting here with my eyes on the clock, watching the minutes just slowly tick by. I knew Richard for uh, a number of years, but um, my most memorable interaction would have been when he became captain of the second division. Now, Richard was a very, is a very honest, respectful, and determined person. And that determination came out um, during his captaincy. Yeah? Um, when he got the captaincy, he always said he wanted to leave a legacy in terms of the second division team and, and bring them to a level from the bottom of the table to the top. And that he did. But he was also a very strict person, a very professional. You had to be professional, right? Um, one of the things too I, I remember, and it's, it's quite hilarious, it's not that he was a very rigid person either, but you had to be, you had to be on time and you had to be professional. But what he did in terms of bringing the second division around, he actually brought the second division to quarterfinals, right? Having the second division probably never even went to quarterfinals until that year. In, in the game before the quarterfinals, the opposing team got there late. So actually, cricket was supposed to start at one o'clock. And we were pretty much there already, getting ready to claim the game at one o'clock. Then we see all these guys running because they were playing in the country. So we see all these guys running coming through the bush. And these were the guys that we were playing again. So what he would do, again, professionalism he brought to the game, he would always give man, match, man of the match trophies to Orsay, whoever performed well. But he would also give a gift um, to the opposing team. And that Saturday, he gave the opposing team a plaque but he also gave them a clock because he said um, it seems as though you all have an issue with time with being on time so i'm going to give you all a clock funny enough the the clubhouse didn't have a clock so that was one of the things that was kind of hilarious the next thing is that in the quarterfinal um he always told us when we get the cricket go and look at the wicket you know and then come back in with you know a uh, uh, idea of whether we should bat or bowl. That didn't mean though that he was going to do what you said. It was still his call. But all of us went out and we looked at the wicket. To us, the wicket was fine. 
you decide, you know, it might seem a bit. So maybe we should bowl. And as the game was getting ready to commence, um, Richard asked the umpire to measure the wicket. We just say, umpire, I need to have that wicket measured. So we are all there now running. What's going on? Why, why he asked me to put a magic wicket? We went and looked at the wicket. The wicket looked all right. But funny enough, when the umpires measured the wicket, the wicket was six inches too long. And six inches too long means that that's the difference between a good length ball and a short ball. So on my way home, I asked him, I said, Richard, how, how, how you know that something was wrong with the wicket? He said, Raleigh, I saw the gunsman doing some funny things, right? When he was measuring the wicket. He, he went forward, he went back, he, he said, and I had a funny feeling about this guy, and that's why I asked the magic wicket. He was, he was meticulous. That's, that's another word for him, meticulous, right? Make sure everything was in order. This is a man that will go and spin the toss in a blazer. So he got his weights on, but he will have to put his blazer on. That, that is a measure of the man, some, some big steps to follow. One of his favorite sayings was that positives are in people. Positives are in people, negatives are in photographs. We always say that, especially in our team meetings, right? Um, and and that, that went a long way in terms of helping us to develop and helping a lot of the younger people to develop as, as, um, as cricketers and as, as people on the whole, really and truly. Um, yeah. Next up, we're going to be having a performance by Bianca Boyce, and then we're going. She's going to be followed by Lisa Hackett. Good morning, everyone. Blessings to everyone. I'm gonna do something very different today. We're gonna to do the song a cappella. So I want a little help from the audience, if you don't mind. Just put your hands together. Here we go. Koya, when I need you, my heart's on fire. Come on. You come to me, come to me wild and wild. Oh, you come to me, give me everything I need. If you want to sing along, you give me a lifetime of promises, world of dreams, yeah. Sounding good. Speak the language you love like you know what it means, yeah. Oh, you can be wrong. Take my heart and make it strong. Come on. Come on. Come on. All, right. All right. Here we go. You're, You're better, better than all the rest. rest. Come, on. Come on. You're better, better than anyone. 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 I hang on every word. Tear us apart. Baby, I'd rather be dead. Each time you leave me, I start losing control. You're walking away with my heart and my soul. I can feel it even when I'm alone. Oh, baby. You're better than all the rest. Come on. You're better than anyone. Anyone I ever met. I stuck on your heart. I hang on every word you say. Tear us apart. Baby, I'd rather be you're simply the best. 
We love you, Richard. You can do it. Good morning, everyone. I was stopped by Mr. Stout to love someone when they are here. Never ever wait until someone is gone to let them know how you feel about them. For 28 years, this phenomenal man has been by my side, guiding me, motivating me, and inspiring me. It was not easy because he was so strict and set in his ways. It was his way or no way. He gave me so many opportunities in life. Just to mention a few was my first job in Bridgetown, which he placed my son in a nursery and popped in every day to make sure I was there. My first job on a cruise liner, singing all around the island, in hospitals, children's home. Any opportunity he saw fit for me, he made sure that I was there. In 2002, I had, I had what, who we call the Teen Talent Baby. And he was always in Richard Hand. He was my first visitor at the QEH and he quickly became fond of him. He was always running around the workshop and Richard adored and loved him. So in 2010, when my son passed away, Richard dedicated that year in honor of him and was always there for me. We are all here. We all here know this good man, the man with the golden face as he referred to his spits on the wall in his final days. The man that will never leave you without, will never leave you hungry and would go beyond means for anybody or would give his last. The man Richard so this man Richard so I had the opportunity to spend his final days with him. We talked about so many things, and although he was in pain, he still had a sense of humor and would make you smile or laugh. I find comfort first to know that he is out of his pain and in a better place, and that he passed away knowing how much I love him. Every day he was saying, Lisa, I thank God for you. You are truly heaven sent. But no, Richard, I thank God for you. No amount of words can repay you, or no amount of words can describe how I feel today, or how much I am going to miss you. Thank you for being you. Thank you for everything. I will miss driving you around, going to our favorite spot, the office bar in town. Teen Talent Show will never be the same, but just like every year, I will be there. Your legacy will live on within all of us. To Kevin, your dad died so proud of you. He never thought you was interested in stepping up and taking over this show. But you proved him wrong. There is so much more I can say, but Richard, you already know because I told you before you leave, before you left us. You are not here, but I hope you are listening. This song is for you. I came by today to see you I thought I had to let you know If I knew the last time that I held you Was the last time I held you And never let go Always kept me awake at night, wondering. I lie in the dark, just asking why. I've always been told you won't be called home until it's your time. I guess heaven was needing a hero. Somebody just like you Brave enough to stand up For what you believe And follow it through When I try to make this make sense In my mind the only conclusion I come to is heaven was needing a hero like you. I remember 
remember the last show I saw you. Oh, you held your head up proud. I laughed and smiled when I saw how you were standing out in the crowd. Oh, you're such a part of who I Now the part is just a vote. No matter how much I need you now, haven't needed you more. I guess heaven was needing a hero. Somebody just like you. enough to stand up for what you believe when I try to make it make sense in my mind the is heaven worth needing That's you, Richard. I hate to leave you, but I cannot stay. Though I'm really, 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 really gonna miss you. Miss you so Goodbye now, my Beijing boy I hope to see you someday Rest in peace, Richard. I will always love you. Thank you. Next, we will be having a tribute by Angela McGarry. Good morning, everyone. I am reading this tribute on behalf of Angela McGarry, who was the judges coordinator for the Richard Stout Show for 15 years prior. So, good, oh, oh, the reason why I'm reading it is because she's not in very good voice. Okay, good morning to the congregation. I have pictured this day in my mind and asked myself when this day came, what would I do? How do I befittingly pay tribute to a renowned humanitarian, a Renaissance man whose nobility caused him to be deeply enamored by all those who had the pleasure of making his acquaintance? For most people, Sir Richard was regarded as a talent scout, mentor, and godfather of local entertainment. But to me, the appellant, appellation, appellation that suited him most was that of a hero. In line manner, a hero is a dominant force in one's life. Therefore, the pain of losing one's life hero is often palpable, making it extremely difficult to say goodbye. In the words of American writer Joseph Campbell, a hero is someone who has given his or her life to something bigger than oneself. When we speak about punctuality, we speak about Richard. He was a stickler for time. 
If he says six o'clock, he meant six. He didn't mean six or five. His shows always commenced on time. At the stroke of the clock, the national anthem could be heard across the venue. Then there's Richard the Sportsman. One day, Gabby, now the Honorable Dr. Anthony Carter, and I were having a conversation. He said to me, Anne, you know what your boy Dick Stout did to us one time? We were playing a cricket match, and he was a captain. Just so he sent all of us, including his brother Mark, off the field, and proceeded to be the lone bowler and a fielder. When it was time to bat, he said he had to bat 11 times. He got out six times. After a laugh, I dialed up Richard to verify if this was true or just a joke. His response was, yes, Angie, when you are playing cricket, you are on the field. When you come to watch, then you are in the pavilion. They did not come to play. They came to watch. He further explained, Angie, if you are doing anything and being paid, you give 110%. If you are volunteering, you also give 110%. I don't have to check behind you to see if you have the judges in place on Sundays. I don't even know who they are, but I know and acknowledge commitment. Agreeably, we have gathered here today to celebrate the life of a true hero and legend, Richard the Great, the first hero and teacher to many within the entertainment fraternity. Regardless of which immersive environments one emerged, this godfather and musical icon made the ultimate sacrifice to ensure that these two groups actively coexisted. So here is to bidding farewell now to our Bajan boy. We are hopeful to see you again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next on stage would be Kabibi Greenwich and Betty Griffith Payne. A lot of people would not have known that I've known Richard for, let's say, 16 years of my life. And I've been through a lot. Um, losing my mom, he was the only one that was there for me. After that, losing my two daughters, he was still the only one that was there for me. So I'm going to take this time to sing this song for him. If you know it, you can sing along with me and help me, please. Took some 
Good morning to everybody. Um, Richard was more than a hero. Richard was a teacher. Richard taught me to believe in myself when I was the most shy, introverted little girl who wanted to become a singer. And he taught me that the sky was the limit, believe in myself at all times, and just go for whatever I wanted to achieve. This song is called To Serve With Love, because he was that teacher to all of us. Those schoolgirl days of telling tales and biting nails are gone. But in my mind, I know they will still live on and on. But how? Someone who's brought you from crayons to perfume. It isn't easy, but I'll try. If you wanted the sky, I would write across the sky in letters the song. Richard, we love you, we'll miss you. Keep singing until we meet again. Rest in peace.
Next up, we will be having a tribute by Mary Yearwood. Hello, everyone. So how do I keep a straight face after all these touching musical renditions? Well, I wrote everything down in case I'm lost for words which, ironically, I never am. <laughs> Greetings to all. I'm going to read a poem written by Mr. Ricardo Durant, Ricky, and Mr. Mike Remy, on behalf of our special New Jersey group, which includes Marcia Durant, Shirley Holder, Lynette Bourne, Ben Yearwood, and myself. It's called The Dash. I read of a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on the tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that first came the date of birth and spoke the following date with tears. But he said what mattered most of all was the dash between those years. For that dash represents all the time that they spent alive on earth. And now only those who love them know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we live and love and how we spend or dash. So think about this long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left that can still be rearranged. If we could just slow down enough to consider what's true and real, and always try to understand the way other people feel, and be less quick to anger and show appreciation more, and love the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering that this special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things they say about you about how you spent your dash. In the arms of eternity, Sir Richard Stout continues to orchestrate celestial melodies, harmonizing with the souls of fellow entertainers who have graced the stages of heavenly realms. A grand practice session unfolds with the heavenly chorale resonating with the timeless voices of Norma Stout Mike Wilkinson, Jackie O'Bell, Jiggs Curtin, Don Marshall, Lord Radio, and the countless Beijing musicians who have joined the Cosmic Ensemble. As we bid farewell to this earthly chapter, may Sir Richard's legacy echo through the ages, a testament to a life well-lived and melodies that transcend time from Ricardo Durant and Mike Remy. And from me and my family, Richard, this special greeting or message is from Ben, Christian, Michael, Jana, myself, and also from the Karoo family. You know that I loved you. We all love you. And we know that you all loved us, that you loved all of us. In fact, you loved everyone, especially the children. You've done your job. You've completed your task of showing us all how much you loved us. For that, you will always be in our hearts and minds. And throughout the ages, your name will be on our tongues, 
and on the tongues of new generations of Barbadians, men, women, and children alike. Now, take your place in that heavenly choir. Join your loving predecessors as you hear our heavenly Father say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen. Next up on stage is Adrian Clark and Barry Chandler. Good morning, everyone. We all remember Richard Stout as Teen Talent Boss, as I love to call him, and the entertainer. But the most of Richard's entertainment happened backstage, talking utter lies. And those of us who know of Richard Stout, and Smokey Burke and the likes, knows what backstage was like. So those of you who sat in the audience, what you got on stage was one thing, but those of us who were privileged to be backstage with Richard, we got <laughs> a belly full. So we'll always remember you, Richard. You rest in peace. The love remains. When I am alone and sit and dream and when I dream the words are missing Yes, I know that in a room so full of light that all the light is missing But I don't see you with me, with me Close up the windows, bring the sun to my room through the door you've opened Close inside of me the light you see that you met in the darkness. Time to say goodbye. Horizons are never far. my own with you I will go no that on a sea that's at no they don't exist anymore it's time to say goodbye when you are so far away I sit and dreamt of the horizon then I know that you are here with me Building bridges over land and sea Shine a brighter light for you and me To see for us to be Time to say goodbye Horizons are never far Would I have to find them alone Without true light of my own With you I will go On ships over seas That I now know No anymore without your light of my own with you 
Back when I was a child Before life removed all the innocence My father would lift me high And that's when my mother ran me And then spin me around and I fell asleep down up the stairs he will carry me never knew for sure i was love if i could get one final chance one final walk one final dance with him i'll play a song that will never ever end how oh, I love, 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 dance with my father again. Ooh. When I and my mama disagree, yeah, yeah, to get my way out one run from her to him. He makes me laugh just to call for me. Then finally make me do just what my mother say. Lay down and now and I fell asleep. He snuck a all under my sheet. Never dreamed that he would be gone from me If I could get one final chance One final walk One final dance with him I'll play a song that will never ever end Oh, I love, love, love Dance with my father again Sometimes I listen to Santa's old And I heard all my mama cry for him I pray for even more than me I know I'm praying for my so much But I could easily be the only man she loved I know I don't do this usually But in love she's dying That's when my father This is all I ever dreamed 
Please, Mr. Richard Sound. We love you. Dance with my father again. Next, we will go straight to the video. So suddenly, so strange. Life wakes you up, things change. I've done my best, I've served my call. I believe these are words Mr. Stout would have said. The special memories of you will always make me smile. Your wit and humor will live on for a while. I remembered you said we would sit and talk like we used to as soon as you get back on your feet. But that didn't work out as planned because God has had prepared your seat. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to work within your show. It is indeed a pleasure. I can only reminisce of our conversations and many morning calls, the jokes we shared. Everything about you had an impact on me. People like you are rare. You dealt with the children like they were your own. You made sure every contestant was prepared for the competition, whether it was vocally, getting clothes, getting shoes, you made sure they were sorted. I admired that about you. Remembered one of my favorite jokes that you would have told was when a contestant was rehearsing and he stopped singing and he held his throat and you said, son, what is the matter with you? And he said, sir, I lost my voice. And you said, well, son, go outside. If you find it out there, you can come back and sing again. I found that so hilarious. I think that you were more a comedian than a singer because your, your game was really strong. You should have been on a lineup when we had Comedy Fest because that was a strong point for you. I'm going to surely miss you. I remember you saying to me, in the hospital that you gave your life to God and that was the best feeling ever. You said that you're sorry that you didn't go there before, but nothing happens before the time. And I also felt good to hear you saying that it was a good feeling. So rest assured, some people don't get the chance to say, I'm giving my life to God, but I am happy to know that you did that and you are making your way to the Golden Gate. On the behalf of the Team Talent Committee, the sponsors, patrons, and people from all walks of life, may you rest in peace and rise in glory. Thank you. What to say about Mr. Stout? Um, he was a genuine person. He was someone that you can call any time of the day. He was always willing, he was always supportive, he was always there for everyone that it was in need. Mr. Stowe, when I first met him, he actually he didn't know that I was working for him at the time. Um, and the reasoning for me just assisting was because he was a person that he helped everybody that needed someone. He was a person, well, the, the voice for the person that did not have any. Um, so I think to myself, if a man is so selfish and he does do something for somebody and he doesn't even know them, why can't I do something good for him? So I just began to assist where necessary until he found out. <laughs> and he asked if he could meet me, we met. And from there, instead of being Rachel, instead of being the person that worked for him, I simply became rich. I simply became a part of his everyday. In and out of Teen Talent, we interacted. In and out of Teen Talent, we kept in touch. And it went from a professional working relationship to simply being friends, and from their family. 
I would never forget Mr. Stokes for being the man that he was. I would never forget his memory, his teachings, and for him for being a downright kind human being to everybody. What more would I say about Mr. Stokes? Well, one memory since he has passed away kept resonating in my mind. That is when my grandmother had passed away. And at that time in my life, I didn't know what to do. I was always a person that had a direction and know exactly how I felt. But at that time, I didn't. And uh, Mr. Stout would call me every second, not about work, not about anything, team talent. At that time, the show was going on. And he would just ask me about my day. He would ask me how I felt. He said, Rich, if you needed anything, call, big or small, even if it was somebody to just say how you felt, even if you wanted to cry, even if I could not get to him, he will come. And uh, he was just, he was just always there. So, now to think about life and everything that is going to go on and not see him. Not have things for the important stuff. It is like you don't know what to do. But at the end of the day, I know that sometimes if you have a problem and you think real hard, you will ask yourself, what would Mr. So do? And you would just get through it. I know what to say. Sir, if you were here, the conversation normally went, how was your day? We would talk about every and anything. We would interact. We would just be in each other's company. And at the end, he always let us know that he appreciated us, that he loved us, and he thanked us for everything that we did for him, big or small. And for that, I say, sir, I love you. I would never forget you. And may you rest in peace. Mr. Richard so was unique. He loved to talk. He yeah, was very soft-spoken. He had a passion for developing people. And Richard Graves. Okay, everybody.
ladies and gentlemen, as we get ready to close this part of the program, you would have heard a voice. I want you to know that two years ago, as the MC of the Richard Stout Teen Talent, I was fired not by Richard, not by Kevin, but by this young man who came backstage and said, Grandpa, are you ready to do what Alf doing? So he said he want MC part of his grandfather's show. So I want Madam Roberts, you have a future MC, Kaden. <laughs> so you're, you're going to introduce the last performer and then we're going to invite the family to get the final viewing as we get ready for the main part of the service. Next up on, next up on stage is Trinity Clark. Good morning, everyone. I just want to offer my condolences from, on behalf of my mom and I. Uncle Richard would call me just to see how I was doing, and he would always encourage me to stay committed to singing, and they have, and they will continue to. He would always tell me even before um, I really knew what I had, that I would be one of his teen talent stars. And then in 2017, I was able to make one thing he said to me happen. And he would call me his granddaughter. He would call my mom his forever star girl or his queen. And so may he rest in peace. Must have been cold there in my shadow to never have sunlight on your face. You were content to let me shine, that's your way. You always walked a step. Beautiful smiles 
Thank you, Trinity. Can the following persons please assemble at the back? Joanne Rollins, Carol Roberts Reefer, Donna Williams, Rashida Codrington, Romancia Murray, Carrie Ann Baino, Marcia Padmore, Anisha Watson. Can those persons please assemble at the back? Wonderful memories, stories of inspiration, stories of courage, love, and uh, compassion. The stories of how one man influenced the lives of many youngsters in Barbados positively. <sighs> Live coverage of the funeral service for Richard Dick Stout here in Barbados on the 15th of December, 20. 23. Interestingly enough, the words of the youngsters and all those who paid tribute reminds us of what was spoken by the Prime Minister after the announcement was made that the amphitheater will be dignified by his name. The Prime Minister said, if the debt owed to him by those who have followed him into the entertainment industry over the past half century is anything to go by, then there is no other entertainer to whom the country owes more than Richard Dick Stout. The Prime Minister went on his unmatched contribution to the entertainment life of Barbados, particularly since independence requires that his name, his legacy, and his never daunted approach ought to be immortalized in a place where every Barbadian will forever see displayed the qualities inherent in the label Bajan. And the band of the Barbados Police Service prepares to inspire us Just about 10.30 a.m., the funeral service proper will commence with those familiar opening sentences, I am the resurrection and I am the life. The officiating ministers are the Reverend Dr. Martel Farley, the Reverend Dr. Samuel Alcott, the Reverend Dr. Anderson Kelman, and the Reverend Marina Taylor. We celebrate the life of Richard Dick Stout, who for his outstanding contribution received several awards and honors, including the Jackie Opel Award, the Clement Payne Award, the Barbados Silver Star in 2009, and what was then called the Gold Crown of Merit from the government of Barbados. And entertainment and music certainly have always been associated with Richard Stout. He produced over 50 singles and five albums. He's the band of the Barbados Police Service. Sir, the honor. 
Honorable Mayor Amor Motley greeted and being escorted to the casket to view the body of Richard Dick Stout. Please stand for the playing of the national anthem of Barbados.
please remain standing for the reception of the body. receive the body of Richard the Thalbert Stout. And he said to me, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. Let me die the death of the righteous, and let my last end be like his. The eternal God is thy refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. God is our refuge and strength a very present help in our time of trouble. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous will have into it and is safe. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide on the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Thou will keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. Let us pray. Almighty God and most gracious Heavenly Father, we come into your presence today fully aware of your goodness and your mercy towards us. We thank you for the life of our deceased brother and a friend, Richard. We thank you for the contribution that he would have made to the island of Barbados. We thank you for the impact he would have had, particularly on the life of our young people. And now that he's gone, it helps us to fully appreciate those persons that would have made a significant contribution to this island. Your word reminds us that they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. And we're also aware that while our weeping will endure for the night, joy comes in the morning. Yet still underneath are the everlasting arms. I bring those who mourn this morning before you. I'm asking you, God, that you would strengthen their hearts his family, 
his close friends, those whom he would have interacted with, we know that their hearts are heavy. We know that the pain they're going through is not easy to bear. But we've learned to place all of our confidence in you. So today, we surrender all to you. And everything that should be said or done today, we are asking that you would bless it. And that today will be a very meaningful one for all of us. In Jesus' name we ask thee. Amen. Blessed morning to all of you. Thank Reverend Kalman for the opening sentences and Reverend Ellicott for the opening prayer. We welcome you, especially we welcome Honorable Prime Minister Smartly and the Cabinet, and indeed the members of the family. We are here because we, we care. And we just want to encourage you, even as you mourn, to remember, in the midst of your pain, you can be guaranteed of God's comfort. And you need the comfort of all those who are here, and even those who are viewing online. We welcome them as well. We want to invite at this time the worship team to come and sing that lovely song, Amazing Grace. I know we are mourning but we are still want to remember we are giving God thanks for the life of a wonderful man who have impacted many. Worship team.
beautiful song. God's amazing grace, God's amazing love that was poured out on Richard. And indeed, he poured out on many of us the amazing grace of God. You remain standing just for the Bible reading, and we want to invite Caden Stout to come. He's reading from Psalm 11, Psalm 30. Psalm 30, 11, 12. Psalm 30, verses 11 and 12. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O oh Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Um, Grandpa used to tell me every morning before school, children go to school and learn or not a life will catch a living hell over and over again. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm sure he remembered that. For a long time he will. You may be seated. As we move on, continue. We have a video tribute at this time. This is a conversational piece between me and my father, Mr. Richard McDowell Stout. Dad, unfortunately, I cannot be there physically due to contractual obligations. I wish I could be there. Trust me, I wish I could be there. But I'm there spiritually and virtually. In my heart of hearts and my soul of souls, you know I would love to be there. Despite the odds, you and I had our ups and downs, our ins and outs, our highs and our lows, our laughs and our tears. I understood you, and I think you understood me. We are all flawed, and with those flaws, we learn how to protect each other, how to cherish each other. I know you love me, and I know you love all of your children, but if you love Kevin more than you love us all, it was evident. Kevin was your favorite, and that's fine. Uh, it's fine, Dad. I just want to say that I thank you so much for everything that you've given me. Thank you so much for everything you've taught me. And with that, I say to you, rest in peace, Dad. Rest in eternal peace. Your blood will flow. When flesh and steel are one Drying in the color of the evening sun Tomorrow's rains will wash the stains away But something in our minds will always stay Perhaps the final act of meant To clinch a lifetime's argument then nothing comes from violence, and nothing ever could. For all those born beneath an angry star, lest we forget how fragile we are. On and on the rain will fall, like tears from a star, like tears from a star. Oh, on and on the rain will say how fragile we are, how fragile we are. Presenting this tribute to my dad was truly heartbreaking. My heart feels so unreal. Words fail me. Dad, you can never know how much these words have failed me. To describe the pain of losing you, life is indeed a vapor. No long here today and gone tomorrow. 
is now here today gone tomorrow but will remain prayerful faithful grateful and comforted knowing how much you positively affected my life and always how you shaped the lives of many others that i promise you to carry on your legacy with my brother and my sister this i vow to you i will continue your legacy this is my truth in all its transparency i love you dad rest in peace So you had good memories there. At this time, we want to invite Mark Stout, brother of, to come to share his tribute. Following Mark's tribute, you will have a solo rendered by Sky Davis. Sky Davis, winner of 2023. Pardon? All right. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Davis is here. Never mind. A victorious morning to all of us here in the house. It's a great victory today. You would say that because you are here to pay homage to a great man, one of our sons, a man who has risen from virtual obscurity to become someone of prominence. So I want to thank all those who would come today. Madam President, uh, Madam Prime Minister, I would like to just ask for a moment to say to you, to allow me this moment to say to my wife that I've got up the stage. When I left, I wasn't sure, and she's blind too, and she doesn't like to leave me out of her sight. <laughs> so she was making sure that I got here and got here safely. So I want to say thanks. It's an occasion where we look back at the life of my brother. When I came, I heard about all the acronyms and so forth that have been put up and all that, how he's been admirated as the father of entertainment and the godfather of soul and all of that. 
I know of his exploits in cricket because we played that. There's a story to be told. But I don't think a lot of people knew my brother the way I knew him. The old people would say, we rolled in the same stomach and along with him came a sister. You know, we have a geographical family and that is because they're all over the scattered. But if you look down there today, you would see not a couple, not a clan, you would see a family. They don't all have the same names, but they came from the same vein. Stouts. They're here. And they're here to pay homage to this great man. My brother and I and my sister are the products of my mother, the other stout, who came from Westmoreland and St. James, and my father, a Spikestown boy, Ivan Lonon World, came from a crop of seven brothers, and he came down to Bridgetown seeking a better life back in those days. Well, the Orleans, New Orleans would have been our home. And we might have lived in almost every avenue in the New Orleans because the buildings were small, the houses were small, and more often than not, you have to transition from one to the other because of space. The Jamaicans would say spacage. But we were able to manage and I watched my brother and my sister, who was then growing up, was coming to that stage of her life where we have to move out from the bedroom with her because she was reaching that adolescent stage. So we couldn't be there. And I think that that was at the time when my brother went through a metamorphosis. He saw that life was transitional, but he didn't know that word. He, he just thought about it, moving on. And he said, he's got to be a boss. He's got to be in control of things because my sister was not always there with us. He was with my mom at times. And he took over. When my sister grew up, she had a little child, a little girl that she left with us. My father, Richard, and I were in charge of a little two-year-old child. Beautiful baby. She now lives in England with my sister. And she, too, is a singer entertainer and has her own business. But we start to think in terms of what we would do. And I saw how Richard had changed. He had to be the leader. The little girl was able to leave my father as soon as they got the papers sorted out, she was off to England. So we were on track. And this is when he really took over as a brother. Two days after that happened, he challenged me to a cricket match at a little village in Barbiesville called Packland Village. It is not there now, it is where the vendors are show you how small that area was. And he had to be in charge. He was the captain. And believe you me, you heard all that would have been said today that he was a leader. All on those ads and whatnot, you have manager, leader, the principal player in everything. That was him. So the match was to progress, in progress. He went out and he took the toss with one of those pennies back in those days, you know, those big wrong pennies. And he tossed it up because you couldn't spin a coin then. And before he hit the ground, he snatched it up and said, heads, <laughs> I am batting. 
And he went to the paling or fence, as you would want to call it now in this time, and he took out the biggest and broadest piece of board to be his bat. And he shaped it with a knife so it handled. And with the ball that my father had purchased a few Saturdays ago for us to play catch to keep us entertained, he was batting and I was bowling. He hit the ball all over the place. Mainly right past me because the bat was so broad, I couldn't get the ball past his bat. But somehow, as they say in modern day cricket, I bowl a bit off, not knowing what I was doing, but just too fatigued. And he hit it back at me and I caught it. It was my turn to bat. First ball, bang, onto Talman's house. And she started complaining. When I get knocked down my house, I'll be, and so forth. So Richard turned to me and said, well, well Mark, you're out. <laughs> the very first ball. <laughs> and then he had the goal to challenge me to another match. <laughs> so I quickly retired, went through the gate, and went inside and read nursery rhymes. <laughs> Hickory, dickory, dock, and so forth. But that was only the start. <laughs> there was more to come. He looked at life in a very different way. And like I said, everything might, uh, had to be on time. You know? You know what he reminded me of, as we do in English? Something called a visual hyperbole. Where he, a cat, stood in front of a mirror and thought he was a lion. That was Richard. He never relinquished his spot. He, he thought he was alive. And he controlled his life that way. He did things that would cause you to marvel. None of you know that when he was leaving the St. Mary's School, by the way, I ought to tell you that we were students of the St. Mary Junior and Senior School. And then we transitioned to St. Leonard's. He going before me, the mighty Gabby, as you have here, your honorable, was with me. We sat in the same bench at the back of the class, but Richard was ahead of us. And in that school, the legendary Jackie Opel, the legendary young Cassius Clay. Um, we had the limbo dancer who made movies, he was part of that school. But somehow we didn't recognize the talents that we had. Richard sang in a competition, a singing competition, when he was about to leave St. Mary to go to St. Leonard's. It was called the Springer Prize. And the grand prize was $16, he won it. He had to stand at attention and sing an old Irish song, oh Danny boy, oh Danny boy, the pipes are called. And he did that. $16 was divided, the school got eight, and my father got eight. <laughs> so we were able then to buy some board and either side ends and so forth, and move out from Batman Village to Becker's Land in 1957. My good friend Wiggins will tell you about that because he was living in the audience at the time, and he got some land down there. Back in that day, there used to be the friendly societies run by a man called Elder. So he used to save a little 50 cents and so forth, not big a lot of money. But that helped to help to get a house. And there we were. My sister, as I told you, would have been in England by then, and it's just the two of us. At school, at 12 years old, he was with his big sister, Michael, around the hotel circuit, and he was participating, he was singing. 
He was in the bath at New Orleans where everything happened then, where Jackie Oprah would come through and mentor those fellas. And it gave birth from rise to a number of singers, the Opels. And it was through Richard's initiative that the Opels were given that name, the Opels. I understand it hasn't been changed since then. But that's what he called. And he sang with them, the Braffitt brothers, Kenrit and Henderson, Mitch Springer, and a bass man out of the ordinary class called Lord Jesus. He's not gone home. Charles O'Dell, Tyrone Prescott. Those were the little names that came through that bath. And Richard had to balance his time between playing cricket and being in the bath. Jackie Opel said that the acoustics in the bath, it wasn't really the bath where you go to bed, it was in a section, oops, where they would have the, the urina. And it was hardly being used, so the fathers used it. And once you go in there, it was like a recording studio. So he worked with them. Worked with my big brother and my big sister Norma. And they sang around the circuit. Started to make money. And one day my father told him that he should go and learn a trade. Nobody in this audience would know that Richard has worked at nothing other than entertainment. So he sent him down to Mr. Barrow at the bottom of Kensington New Road to learn how to the printer each trade. He went down. Not anxious, but he went. And my brother had, a, <laughs> I don't know, he, uh, he was uh, 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 he, a liking for oxymorons, those of you who would know them. Yes, and he would talk about the honesty, bittersweet, and he said, those are not the things. I remember he had a, a poster with P.I.G. the cat, his dance was to go, and he printed, because he changed it, he changed it from P.I.G. the cat to C.A.T. the cat, because he thought that that was the correct and appropriate thing to do. Mr. Barrow sent him home. He, <laughs> and he came home and he told my father he wasn't going back. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my brother did many things. Honestly and on time, he loved people, particularly the children. He was a mentor for my under-15 cricket team at LSE School when we won that. He told me, Mark, the boys must look good. Get cricket cloven for them. Well, that ran me into a bit of trouble because we ordered things that we couldn't pay for. <laughs> but it happened, and we won the championship, so all was well. Alice Lee's name was Adam Brady. It was up there. Richard had his best friend in Nolan Clark. And I'm sorry that I don't have enough time to say exactly how the two of them, but my brother was bitter in the end, there were things that he wanted to do. He wanted to see. He could not understand how Nolan Clark and Winston Reed could not have played with the West Indies. He's gone to the great beyond and he stood out and got a solution. He could not understand why his son, Kevin, who was a pivotal player in the West Indies B team and a Barbados team as a captain and a player and making runs and getting wickets could not even make a franchise team. He was bitter with the authorities. But when he came to the Church of the Nazarene, we asked him to forget those things. Put them behind you. Do not go around with people on your mind. My president of the Association for the Men at the Nazarene Church was able to get him to come down with us and the most important thing, and the triumph of it, is that he gave his life to God. That morning, when that happened, when he took over the mic, 
and he told them about his Lord, how he loved his Lord. That was, so it hit me a revelation, I fell. My president had to come and console me. We at the Nazarene try our best to do many things. I am glad, Brother Richard, you made that decision. You came to Christ and you asked for forgiveness. And because of that, you're a better person today. I brought along some lessons for you, my brother. These are to add to the numerous white shoes that you might want to wear <laughs> when you cross that floor in heaven. Rest in peace, brother. Enthusiastic indeed. Thank you, Mark. Of course, as I said, Sky will draw close enough to Sky. Del Rich, you will also have a group. Those who participated in the Rich Stout in Talent over the years will follow Sky. Sky will come. You have led me to the fire 
they made their way off. I'm sure you want to applaud them again. We thank God. Of course, firstly, Sky, and now this lovely group representing persons who have been involved in T-Town, Richard South T-Town through the years. We can say that he has made a wonderful investment in the youth of a nation. And who's telling the dividends? Who's telling the dividends that we did through the years? Thank you so much. I'm glad you did a good job leading. <laughs> All right, we have two items now. We have first, firstly, one rented by Romancia Murray, um, and then a dance, Rhythm Tribe. Let's welcome them.
We applaud so you enjoyed. Thank you. At this time, um, Kevin will come and share remarks. We have his dad. Kevin? First time is Uncle Mark. I wish I had a memory like yours. I come out here with a whole paper, and you come out here with none. I'm putting out a top speech. <sighs> President of Barbados, Your Excellency Sandra Mason, Prime Minister of Barbados, Mayor Moore Motley. Other members of the cabinet, family members, members of the entertainment fraternity, team talent past and present, cricketers past and present, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. Today is supposed to be a sad day for my family, but I must confess that I'm at peace because I strongly believe that my father, my mentor, my advisor, my coach, and my true friend is resting peacefully. Please permit me to start with recent events and work backwards. Madam Prime Minister, after you visit, visited my dad and you gave him the news about the naming in his honor, he slept the whole day and wake up and tell me my work on this earth 
is finished. You have to carry on. This is so powerful to me because I witnessed my dad give his very last to strangers and also to this country. It was so funny. When he don't eat last thing, he would give you it. A funny thing, poor me, I ain't in the back, Kevin. You know, see what I do? I know give you my last. Spot me something. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. By the way, Prime Minister, when you came over to your house, I always knew that he was a trickster. He lay down in bed all week. All week, ain't say a word. Hardly ever. And when you came, all of a sudden he got full of energy and he sat up and spoke strongly. This was the strongest speech in weeks. But I know you're building it up. My dad, my dad appeared to be with him. On my return from praying for children. He transitioned two days after he returned. My dad got ill. He stopped the fall until the end. He had his weight and still wanted to be in charge. He could believe from the hospital bed. He watching the teen talent show. I'm messaging my poor friend Alf, I feel for Alf, the MC, the stage managers, and the contestants for words of our voice. Our man was a powerful man. He watched the semi-finals and finals from home, and he said, when they got in, Kevin, good job. I said, yes, got him. As dad went to school at St. Leonard's Boys, it was fitting to have the finals there. I suggest a little modernization, you know, young people taking over so we got things like fancy. I replaced the banners with screens, and thanks to Randy Eastman, who brought everything to life for me. Created a different vibe on the stage to complement the live band from the NCF. And I want to say thank you very much to the NCF and also for this day. The place looks really nice and it's really suiting for my father. <laughs> After the finals, Dad looked at me and said, So you ready to take over then? I said, Yeah, but I'm missing one thing my own white shoes. <laughs> He prepared me for this long. He prepared me for this long ago, as a young boy. I had to be at the shows. I met a lot of people, a lot of stars, and I learned a lot. Over the last two years, as often as possible, I would attend the show along with this little man next to me. And I took notes and I noted how Dad did things. Dad was not tech savvy. I mean, geez, on back in the days, I had to play with the ball to keep the attention. But he knew entertainment at all. Barbados gave him the name Grand Godfather. The Godfather legacy will live on. My brother Rakeem, a professional entertainer and a wonderful singer. Clearly he got that from, dog, from dad. My sister Sherry, meticulous like dad. My deceased brother Ryan and his family is here. Thanks, be, thanks for being with us today. He was very jovial and funny. A comedian like dad. And then there's me. Everybody said my walk, I just look just like daddy. My love for cricket and fashion is all rich as I know my siblings may think I was his favorite, but dad loved, loved us all dearly. In fact, when it came to children, he looked out for all of them. A number of my cricketing friends were raised by my dad. His final day was confusing for me because I never claimed this close to death before. As his pain intensified, he clearly was nudging me to leave the room, but I could not understand what he was trying to just say. I knew it was coming, but I was not prepared to walk into the house and not see my dad watching cricket, listening to brass stats, or picking a song for his teen talent, and they're gonna say his children, canvasser contestants. I was not prepared for my son to be coming home and saying grandpa and then remembering that grandpa is not there. Dad was stern. If he had to be, 
he did not hurt his feelings, and I know that well. This has stirred, this has stirred me in good stead. When you believe in something, stand by it. That was my supporter. When I was mere, cap, when I was mere cricket captain of the Barbados team, he traveled to Trinidad to watch me. I felt like a general because my first coach was my dad. I saw I was being watched by the man who taught me some tricks about my batting, telling me every time I bat, keep the ball up on the ground like blackbirds picking up crumbs. <laughs> some tricks with the slower ball. I am told, but I'm told, I even saw for myself that he had a very, very long run up because he said he was a fast bowler. And every delivery ball, they got slower and slower and slower. <laughs> I mean, the debate is still out about who's the better batsman. To tell you the truth, I have more shots, and I never score 100 in a day. But dad, dad had more styles, but he would take a whole week to score 100. <laughs> Regardless if it was a food match, a celebrity game, or when he was playing cricket for Carrington, as captain, daddy would always flick the toss in a blazer. That's how sharp my mom was. You could not play cricket with my dad in color socks. Uncle Mark, you will know about this. Shirts with holes, and you could not be late, because if you're late, you know for sure you ain't no play. I'm sure Gabby and Uncle Mark will tell you all about the Chapman Lane story when he sent off all of them and play a cricket game by himself. <laughs> and the funny thing about it, he win the game too. <laughs> and broadcast it through the whole of Orleans and Chapman Lane, which is still beat. 11 men by yourself. <sighs> please, please permit me to tell you a little story about my dad. The humor is on my dad, though. So one night, when dad used to socialize, he and some friends went out and they had a ball. I mean, they had a blast. In the morning, dad shouting, Kevin, you see my white shoes? I said, dad, where did you leave them? We look all over the entire house and no shoes appear. You might say, well, I can't understand what you're doing with my white shoes at all, at all, at all. And we looking, and we looking to the, the point I got tired. I said, Daddy, let me go in the fridge for a glass of water. <laughs> As I opened the fridge door, in front of me sitting comfortably were a pair of white shoes. <laughs> I said, Dad, a fridge is supposed to have food, drinks, but no, a fridge is carrying a pair of just stout white shoes. <laughs> So who was here a part of that crew that went out that night? Meet me outside, I want to hear more about this story. <laughs> the sense of humor was on. As you heard earlier, Dad gave a cricket team a clock for turning up late. He gave a team a tape measure because the pitch was too long. My dad was so serious about cricket, he refused to let me play for Westbury Primary School because the coach wanted me to play with only the front part on. He tell me, Kevin, cricket is played in two parts. To visit our home, everybody had to bowl at me. And if you didn't bowl at me, no bowl, no entry. <laughs> How did I get? <sighs> How did I get to grow up with my dad? My mom is migrating to the US, and my dad was firm. And my dad said, Joe, you know what? You're going to, to the US, you could go along. But you know what? You're going to left you. <laughs> My dad raised me and taught me a lot about life. I'm going to be honest. Many of his rules I did not understand until his death. You cannot just turn up at daddy's house, and any of these can attest to that. You had to call first. I can remember a man coming to our house. A dad said to the boss, you know you have to call first before you come. But Richard, I do not have a phone. My father said, no problem, I can fix that problem for you. Daddy walked to the bedroom and got a quart. I told him, man, you see when you walk back at this road here, turn right. <laughs> you will see phone booth by the supermarket, give me a call. <sighs> Dad hardly went into people's homes. His circle was small, although he helped many. Listen well, he did not beg for himself. Even if he was in need, 
Dad had a stern side. As my dad sat at home making calls, I listened to how manly he spoke to sponsored friends and officials. On the other hand, if he had to be stern, he did not hurt his feelings. Dad made sure my son Caden was good as I traveled to play cricket. Dad was overjoyed when Caden signed the national pledge for the, to the, for the UNICEF in the Botanical Gardens in 2022, and Dad insisted, insisted that Caden wasn't late. I mean, that he was early. <sighs> Dad, I'm making a pledge to you to assist Caden. You see me how you assist me. You see me how you walk with my gear bag? Yes, I can walk with Caden's gear bag too. On that note, I told the family at home, do not place the word late on the announcement or do not bring him here late. <laughs> Anisha, my dad's auxiliary nurse, I want to thank you a lot. It was so funny, because the love hate situation, friendship that they had, it always used to crack me up. You helped daddy too. His sickness, you made him feel comfortable, even though I'm gonna crawl. I could see the friendship there. I even sneak in the room one time and hear daddy playing one of his songs for you. So I know it had to be something special about you. Cub, Cub, boy, what a man you were. When I was overseas, I was unable to get back home after hearing that daddy was ill. I had to go to his, the hospital. You, you filled in for me, and I'm grateful. I never tell you another story about Dad. When Dad knew he was going to the hospital, I still had a couple of cricket games left. And I called Dad and I said, Daddy, I'm looking for your first flight to come home. Daddy stopped and said, you looking for your first flight to come home to do well? Tell me, son, you're a doctor? <laughs> I said, no, but Daddy got to come home. He said, no. I give me good. Michelle from Caribbean, you came to assist with, with Dad. And my family is grateful for that. An angel in our eyes. But Marcy and Donna, you kept me smiling through his sickness. Lisa Hackett, I feel you should become a priest. <laughs> you read, you write so much scripture verses to Daddy by his bedside in the hospital and even at home. Carrie and Rachel, your support with Dad is invaluable. Joyce, a nurse friend from the US, one of Daddy's good friends. I think that's what I tell you about here and initial friendship. Daddy know your nurse friend coming in before you be cool. You know Daddy look at Anisha and tell she, I want you know a real doctor coming. <laughs> and Anisha laugh. All she used to tell me is that, Kevin, you know your dad moved real sharp. <laughs> I say yes, that's my father. Mr. Toppin from Sewing World, I mean, your contribution will never, ever be forgotten. That was one of Daddy's closest friends. Auntie Cheryl. <sighs> Auntie Cheryl, I gotta say thank you. When Dad went to the hospital, Auntie Cheryl stayed with Dad for two days straight until Daddy was placed on a ward. Refused to move, refused to do anything, but just stay there, Richard, and keep his company. Auntie Cheryl, many thanks to you. Pastor Kelman, you are dear to my family. I saw my father over the last two years transform into a giant for the Lord. He took church seriously. If my dad could do it, anyone can. Mommy Joanna Smith Rawlings, don't let me forget your last name. It's not a story, it's Rawlings. I love you dearly, but you know daddy raised me. Your support, Will always be there regardless. And these guys that you see standing on the stage, Jason Paris, Andrew Emptage, Sadie Hill, these are my brothers. And my brothers from a different mother, and also a different father, too. <laughs> <laughs> you get asked straight. <laughs> they all helped raise me as a child coming up. I could not go to no place unless these were going. No party, Jason going, Sadie going, Jamming going. No, all right, we know you ain't going. <sighs> there are many of you who are allowed to be by his bedside. I don't want to extend thanks to each and every one. 
I cannot count the calls or the messages. We appreciate, we appreciate all of them. My family is honored to have shared Richardstown with the world. Finally, listen well. My take on it, we need to acknowledge people more when they are alive. There's so much division in the entertainment fraternity. And my thing is, when you hear someone sounds playing on the radio a lot, I say, look out, something wrong. Is either this body sick, dead, or is it birthday? And I don't think it should be so. We have too much talent in Barbados, coming from Richard Stoughton talent. <laughs> to all the international stars that over the past through the teen talent, to not be hearing these people's music more consistently on the radios. <laughs> we need to support our own and support them strongly because at the end of the day, I train that anything and support the Belgian. Belgians have to support Belgians. <laughs> I will continue to say, I know my daddy can be pleased. Why you guys set it down your road with one of your partners? <laughs> so today, my dad will be pleased as by tonight, he and Jackie Opal will be singing some sports tonight for sure. In addition to that, his mother, Leota Stout, who is also buried less than 100 yards away from dad, Grandma Stout, make sure he sings Beijing Girl to you for the rest of the night. I want everyone to continue to enjoy the celebration. Richard Stout was a giant. He lived a full life. I know he leaves a legacy that will live on. I love you, Dad. Thank you, Kevin. I'm sure those are memories that will sustain you through the years. I want to crave the Prime Minister's indulgence. Um, she's the next person who to speak. Um, but we have Colin Spencer has to leave urgently. So I want to invite him to come at this time. Prime Minister, please, excuse me. Um, Colin. Thank you. I know you have to leave early, so thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, there was a mix up there. It really was one of my back end vocalists that had to leave, but. I don't mind, it's, it's better I speak before the Prime Minister. I want to assure all of you that I am not a lunatic, but frequently there are things that come to my head that make me question it. And I frequently say that life is really something else. I came here this morning, the whole season, crop over season, me and Gabby and speaking, he at me, at he, and they put me to sit down beside the man. May he go back now be talking again. So my phone gonna be confused. Next thing is, I looked on the screen, saw Richard Stout in the short pants. And I understand now why he would never, why he never used to go to the beach. <laughs> Next thing I see in the order of the service, I was slated on the order of service to pay my tribute ahead of Ian Webster and Gabby. And I know that that's because I never been the crown. And I strongly believe that Carl Robert Scott said I do with that. <laughs> no boy can't tell me nothing different. She at that girl at me. <laughs> but it's all right. 
I just want to remember Richard. I first, I was introduced to Richard in 1976 on the sidewalk outside of Scotia Bank Broad Street by a gentleman from St. George Anderson Earl who introduced me this way. Richard, this is the fellow to tell you about from St. George who believe in you, the smile like you will bad. I believe that would have been September or October because a couple of months later he contacted me about if, if the band that I was with were interested in being the resident band at Holden where he was the manager. And we took the job primarily for two, two reasons. We were undecided about if we were going to go back on the cruise ship because we knew that the Buccaneers and Barriers did carry very money. And because we knew that in those days, no matter how much praise and support we got in St. George, you didn't nobody in Barbados unless you could say something in town. You had to make your name in town. So we took the job. For me, I had a personal stake in the job because there was this guy from Laura State who I don't know what happened, where he used to appear from, but he used to find himself in Charles Warbridge every night that I am on my way to rehearsal. And he always had this statement. Colin, you're going to holler out now. <laughs> so I had to get this man off my back. I was determined and I am eternally grateful to Richard for employing us as the resident band at Holiday Inn because we got to play alongside the best entertainers of the day. Richard, I thank you. Oh, I, I, can't, I can't pay a tribute to Richard to give you two of his specials. He once told me that he went through St. George to a cricket game and after being there for, for a, bit, a little time, he asked the score and, and the guy told him that it was 742 without loss. And that one guy was 260, and his mother called him to send a shot to buy lard oil. <laughs> so on his return, he would get to bat when somebody's out. The next one was that a band from St. George, because I always St. George, you know. This band from St. George went to play at City Hall Casino in St. John for a dance. And during the course of the night, a gentleman had up a couple of beverages asked one of the vocalists, um, what's the name of this band? And the vocalist told the guy, but we named the Atlantics. I, I believe Sarah Nader was in that band at that time. And the gentleman said, to come to think of it, I didn't even have to ask you the name of this band because the drummer features a shark. <laughs> Which is out, that was Which is out. Thank you, ladies. Let's do this. <laughs> Yeah. 
Just look about Cause Jesus He completely saves And he will lift you By his love And take you Out of the angry waves For he's the master He's the master of the sea And everything His will obeys You, the Savior Want to be So be saved Be saved To them And we are pleased to have our beloved Prime Minister with us. And uh, we want to invite our Honorable Mayor Morley, Amor Morley, to give her remarks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And Colin, you finally know that I always give way to you. He is my constituent. <laughs> How do we measure truly the contribution of a man? We know it is not through material possessions. We know that it is not simply how others measure him. But ultimately, it is in the confidence and the expression of how they live each and every day. And I want to thank Mark and Kevin for sharing stories that are not only soothing to their soul and to that of the family and friends who loved Richard, but speak to who we are as a people. The only way that we can move forward as a nation is by ensuring that at every stage we look at who is next to us, who is behind us, and who needs a hand up. The life of Richard Stout in the entertainment industry of this country reflected a man who was committed to providing that hand up, that guidance, that mentorship, steadfast in his commitment. 
there are many things that start and go. I say all the time that if we want to transform, we need scale. But we also need persistence. We need perseverance. And Richard Stout embodied so many values that stand as a lesson to all in this country. But he wasn't alone. He was one of what will come in my view to be regarded as the great generations of Barbadians, born without much, but blessed with the gift of wanting to succeed and wanting to build and wanting to do better and wanting to go further. And it was that essence that effectively he shared with us when he established the Richard Stout Teen Talent Show 47 years ago. He may not be here for the 50th anniversary, but the show shall be. And that is the essence. And therefore, when it came to determining what was the best tribute, we felt that it had to be something that would live for all throughout the ages. And the place that more and more will come to be associated with entertainment, one of the key places, not the only one, is in the botanical gardens. Because we determined, actually just before COVID, that we would like to build an amphitheater. And then COVID came and disrupted us for the three years. And we then, determined that we would do it in phases. It therefore became an easy choice to understand that his name should adorn that amphitheater because all who come from here on in will ask the question, who was Richard Stout? It must be something to do with the city because out of that small, small place, in the city of Bridgetown. And to the right and to the left, so much talent has emerged. And yet, people would say of Barbados, when I was a little child, that we had a culture. And Gabby put paid to that with his song, Culture, Carrying the Child by Granny. That is we culture. Men, who grew up understanding that their obligation was not only to themselves, but to all else who were around them. On the morning before Richard died, I had the honor to spend some time with him. And yes, Kevin, anyone in that room would never believe that he wasn't talking all week because he was talking nonstop. And he was charming beyond words. Chantal will tell you, Carol will tell you, Kevin will tell you. He kissed my hand, he kissed my hand again. <laughs> he then gave me his and I kissed his. And we were talking and laughing. Gabby, I heard about you and the black socks. And when you get put out the, off the cricket field, and that was when I learned about the him one beating the 11. But I always knew that beyond the clothes and the meticulousness of the outward appearance, there was a meticulousness also of his inner character. And he said to me, and to the rest of us there, the right way is the only way and that that is what he has lived by all of his life. I have asked that whenever the tribute goes up that that quotation goes with it and in the days of modern technology he was not a techie but he will come to benefit from the technology because a QR code that captures his performances and his songs will be there so that any little child or any old person and anybody visiting can go with their smartphone 
and they will ever, forever be able to hear who he was. But it is the measure of the man that will have to be carried on by the stories of those who knew him and in particular those who benefited from his vision that he was simply a conduit through which others would let their light shine. I ask us therefore today, and, and, and I have no doubt, half of our time was not only on entertainment but on cricket and his clear passion. I suspect that his love for cricket was as much about the ability to wear white clothes as it was anything else. And the style that he could produce and present because in everything that he did, he was stylish and cutting it all the time. This country can sometimes reflect a tension that we have to come to understand even as we build out this republic. Those who were born before independence and who had the dream of expressing themselves were not given always the support that they needed. They were seen as outliers. I know it because I've grown up with many of them around me. And in a very real sense, that is what has driven our philosophy to ensure that we can complete the journey of being comfortable in our skin as Bajans and understanding who we are and celebrating who we are. It is unfortunate that Spooge came when it did with a population that was not yet ready to embrace the glory of self and the celebration of who we are. To have the confidence to know that this must be reflected and perpetuated. As I listen to the others sing, how great thou art to the Spooge beat, I thought to myself that those who are young today, like Caden, like you, Bit Bit, you have a responsibility now to build on the work of the giants of this country who have tried to define in song and word and deed who we are as a people. And along the way, it is so easy for that to be drowned out by what is said and what is determined from outside of here. But if we want to learn from Richard, his life was dedicated to being able to ensure that Barbados and Barbadians could be the best that they could possibly be. And we as a people have therefore a responsibility to take that and nurture that and to continue to allow the essence of who we are. Because when you see that sincerity of expression, you know it will be enduring. Richard Stout was the godfather of entertainment, but he was also the godfather of being able to express ourselves in that way. I simply end today with the words of our national hero, Rihanna, modifying it as delivered today by the wonderful expression of dance by Rhythm Tribe. Richard, we shall lift you up and we shall keep you safe and sound in the hearts of our country, in the hearts of our people, in the hearts of those who want the best for all that is Barbados. Because you have allowed our people to understand in the expression of who they are through the Teen Talent Show that they are capable of anything if they apply themselves. And you have given them the opportunity that many would never have had were it not for your hard work and dedication and belief in our people. This country owes you a debt of gratitude. Thank you.
Thank you, Madam Prime Minister. Let's all stand and uh, join in this congregation name, and can it be? Resume your seats. At this time, we want to invite Ambassador David Commission to address you with the eulogy. This is the eulogy of Richard Nathalbert Stout, loyal son of Barbados, 
nation builder, a key craftsman of independent Barbados, and a crucial pathfinder to the Republic. But please permit me to begin by first expressing how honored and privileged I feel to be entrusted with Richard's eulogy by the members of his family. And I would also like to say that I perceive myself to be delivering this eulogy not merely on my own behalf, but on behalf of the entire Richard Stout Teen Talent family. A community that is composed of scores of persons who believed in Richard and his teen talent institution. We are the ones who gathered around Richard and gave him the solidarity and support he needed to carry out the monumental labor of love that he had taken upon his shoulders. We are the loyal and dedicated supporters and fans who religiously attended the shows, prelims, semifinals, finals, week after week, year after year. The family is composed of too many people to list in this eulogy, but I would like to mention some of the, the names of some of those who were associated with Richard on the last leg of his journey, the 2023 edition of Teen Talent. So permit me to mention, obviously, Kevin, Rashida, Rachel, Elroy, Alf, Radar, Donna, Kerri Ann, Pernell, Yvette, Tavon, Janisha, Randy, Romancia, Lisa, Anne Marie, Sheldon, Ramat, Mickey, Ricky, Orlando, Shirley Stewart, Orson, Stephanie, Colette, Aisha, Joanne, the Cadogans, Carol, and the NCF. Brothers and sisters, this eulogy will be a joyous and heartfelt celebration of the magnificent life, personality, and contribution of Richard Stout. But there's one element of sadness and regret that I must first deal with and get out of the way. I first became associated with Richard from about the year 2004 when he started to use the Clement Payne Cultural Center on Crumpton Street for his weekly workshops and rehearsals. So I had close contact with Richard for about 20 years. And the Richard Stout that I knew was a man who only really wanted one thing out of life, namely, to render service to and help to develop and advance the young people of Barbados. Richard was not interested in acquiring any fancy car or big house. He was not interested in going on vacations to opulent destinations or in being invited to VIP functions. He was not interested in amassing personal wealth. He was happy that he had managed to secure ownership of the modest home that he occupied in Black Rock, for that gave him the stability he required to focus his efforts and attention on the young people that he loved and cared for. And permit me to recall to record that he was eternally grateful to the late Prime Minister Owen Arthur, who had intervened with an errant bank manager who had initially refused Richard a mortgage loan to purchase his home on the basis that entertainers were too much of a financial risk to justify lending that type of money to them. Apparently, Mr. Arthur brought that bank manager to Christian understanding 
And Richard, not only did he get his loan, but he successfully paid it off too. By the time I got to know Richard Stout, he was not even interested in advancing his own career as a singer and entertainer. And as we all know, Richard Stout had such international quality talent that he could easily have left Barbados and migrated overseas to greener entertainment pastures. He could easily have taken the same road of his illustrious peers like Llewellyn Jiggs Curtin and Lloyd Wilson Jr., but he did not. He chose to remain in Barbados and to devote his energy and talents to building up our nation. And so the Richard Stout that I knew only wanted to be blessed with good health and energy and time in order to give more and do more for the young people of Barbados. When Richard took ill last year, he was still in full flight, enthusiastically and passionately holding his developmental workshops and spending himself on his precious young people. Oh, how I wish that the fates had given Richard another 10 years or so to continue on his mission. So that, for me at least, is a source of regret and sadness. But I think I perhaps misspoke when I said that the only thing that mattered to Richard was to devote himself to the development of the young people. There was in fact another issue that mattered to him and caused him some concern and even psychic pain. Richard had no interest in material reward or advancement, but he did want to earn and receive the respect and acknowledgement of his people and government. Richard was grateful for the fact that our government had honored him and his work with a Barbados service star in 1993 and a gold crown of merit in 2008. But as the years went on and as the masses of citizens of our country clamored year after year for Richard to be awarded our nation's highest honor, the knighthood, or subsequently, the Order of Freedom of Barbados, Richard found it hard to understand why successive governments turned a deaf ear to the insistent public call. It became something of a dilemma for him when many ordinary citizens started to refer to him as Sir Richard and Calypsonians like Mighty Herring, Kinky Star, and Elroy Tiger, Braffitt composed and sang tribute songs in which he was dubbed Sir Richard. I will say no more about this, except to urge our government, all governments, to be more willing and prepared to listen to the voice of the people when they are telling you who their true heroes are and whom among us they wish to be lifted up and honored. And for the avoidance of all doubt, let me say here and now, speaking, I am certain, on behalf of the masses of the Barbadian people for whom Richard was a veritable folk hero. Bajans at home and Bajans abroad in the diaspora. And I say that Richard Stout deserved to be awarded Barbados' highest national honor several times over. But as you heard from Kevin, he was very pleased and very proud when Prime Minister Motley visited him and he learned that his name is going to be attached to that amphitheater in the 
National Botanical Gardens. And Prime Minister Motley, if you are not aware of it, let me tell you now, Richard Stout had tremendous respect for you. And that is why it meant so much to him when you visited him that morning to convey the news. So I have said quite a mouthful about my friend Richard without telling you anything about his origin, but I think Mark did quite a good job at that, his brother. Um, he was born into a very big family. There were 12 siblings. I give you the names, Ronald, Lolita, Mark, Gregory, June, Harriet, Christopher, Cameron, and Sandra Stout, Michael Wilkinson, the famous singer and, and entertainer, and Norma Stout Holder, equally acclaimed as a singer and known as the Ella Fitzgerald of Barbados. It also needs to be recorded that Richard is, was, is the proud father of four children, Sherry, Ricky, Kevin, and Ryan, who, pre who predeceased him, and that he was the extremely proud grandfather of Jason, Jermaine, Amali, and Caden. And we heard that he was a, a boy of the Orleans. He, he, he spoke openly about the kind of poverty he grew up in. He knew all about using a pit toilet, having no running water in the home, and having to walk from 6th Avenue, Orleans, where the stout home was located, to 10th Avenue to catch a bucket of water from the public standpipe or to avail himself of the public bath. But he said to me that he was fortunate to have a father who instilled confidence and a sense of self-worth in him, a father who constantly encouraged him to be somebody, be respectful, be generous and give, give whenever you can and accept the responsibility of being a man. That's how he described his own father um, to me. He, he also was fortunate in growing up in a New Orleans, a Chapman Lane, an Emerton that was very closely knit, very people who were very supportive of each, of each other. And we all heard that he went to St. Mary's and then to on to um, St. Leonard's Boys School, which they called Richmond back in those days. And I won't, I won't go into that, but his good friend, Anthony Carter, who was also a Richmond boy, um, when Richard passed, Gabby composed this beautiful poem. He entitled it, National Hero Richard Stout. And Gabby was describing the schoolboy Richard Stout, and this is what Gabby said, and I quote, he had this air about him with a gait that was never fast, always immaculately attired, and never walking fast, speaking to every person, good morning, how are you? His shoes were always shining, a dresser through and through. And we know that that is the richest stout we knew as an adult. But apparently he was like that from school days, <laughs> you know. He was very old school. He was a stickler for discipline, good manners, and good decorum. And even if he was going to the supermarket next door, Richard would dress up. And you know, he, he had these old school values. If a... If a a male entered the Clement Payne Cultural Center when rehearsals were going on with a hat on his head. Richard would instruct him to take off the hat, you know. He also had a healthy sense of his own worth and he prized and protected his dignity in an uncompromising manner. He respected all and sundry, but he expected and demanded similar respect in return. And I can tell you, we, we know how, how um, frank 
and um, blunt he could often be in expressing his views and his opinions. And that sometimes turned off some people who preferred, you know, a more diplomatic and comfortable engagement. But if Richard accepted you as his friend, if he assessed you and deemed you to be worthy, there was no more loyal friend. He would defend you uncompromisingly. And, and um, if you doubt me, ask Gabby, ask Greiner, ask Stetson Wiltshire, ask Shirley Stewart, Colin Spencer, Alf. Jeff Hackett, some of, the, some of his friends who have traveled from overseas to be here, Jeff Hackett, Ricky Durant, Mickey Lashley, Richard was a very, very loyal friend. I also want to say he was a very conscious and proud black man. He was very clear about his identity and about his duty to contribute to the black struggle. And of course, we heard about the other side of his personality, his good humor, the consummate comedian. He regaled me with so many stories. I mean, we heard some today. You all remember the one about the, the one foot fast bowler from Ellerton in St. George? Well, you could check me about that one outside. <laughs> but he was always, always telling stories. And even on, in the hospital, in, on his sick bed or in his home, on his deathbed, the jokes never stop flowing. In fact, he put us visitors at ease in the hospital or at, in, in his home, even in the darkest hours. We went there to console him. He put us at ease with his jokes and good humor. And I have no doubt that underlying that capacity to joke and laugh in the face of extreme illness and even death was a deep faith and spiritual strength. In fact, I would have to credit Richard with being possessed of an almost superhuman spiritual strength. He seemed to have no fear of sickness or even death. And like St. Paul, as recorded in the book of 1 Corinthians, the richest stout that I and several others experienced at the QEH and in his final days at home seemed to be saying, O oh death, where is thy sting? O oh grave, where is your victory? Thank God he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. This had to be a man of deep, deep faith um, who had no doubts about where his immortal soul was going. Richard, in the latter years of his life, Richard Stout had developed a deep spirituality and a profound belief in God. But again, I've spoken a mouthful about Richard and I haven't told you anything about the two things he is most famous for, namely his music and his teen talent competition. So let us correct that. You already heard about the days in the Orleans, Rehearsing at the bath, the public bath, Jackie Opel, somewhat older than Richard and the other boys, joining them. Jackie actually gave the, 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 the Opels, the singing group that they formed in the bath, Jackie gave them, Jackie Opel gave them his name, and they became the Opels. And you heard Mark speak about Richard at the age of 12 and 13. On weekends, singing at clubs across Barbados, clubs like the Copa Cabana in Bats Rock, singing all genres of music at 12 and 13. I therefore want to make the claim 
that Richard Stout, so far as singing and entertainment was concerned, was a child prodigy, perhaps Barbados's first child prodigy in that arena. And then something happened to him in 1960. He would have been a mere 14 years old, 1960. And, and this is what cemented his journey into entertainment. 14 years old. And the story is this. There was a popular shop in Baxter's Road called Tory Henry's Shop, where all the well-known entertainers used to gather to perform and sing informally. Big names like Mighty Jerry, Mighty Charmer, the Mighty Producer. And so Richard, at 14, took it upon himself to go to that shop intent on being heard. And he was heard. And the Mighty Producer was so impressed that he offered to compose a calypso for Richard and to enter him in the JC's calypso competition. So said, so done. Producer composed a calypso about a blind man who said that he saw a boy steal bread and tried to convince the magistrate to accept his incredible testimony. The magistrate ended up locking him up. <laughs> Richard placed third in the competition and won the handsome prize of $25. 14 years old. But from then on, the die was cast. Richard Stout was going to become a professional entertainer. He sought and got the approval of his big brother, Mike Wilkinson. But in the years that followed, it is fair to say that his greatest influence, the man who really mentored him, was none other than the great Jackie Opel. And so, it was not long after Richard graduated from St. Leonard's that in 1964, at 18 years old, Richard went into the studios of the Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation. CBC had been set up in 63 at the Lazaretto. In 1964, the 18-year-old Richard went into the CBC studios backed by a band called the Silhouettes and recorded covers of two popular American songs, Tell Daddy and Try Me. That was his first venture into recording. Four years later, he, he had developed, he, he began by recording covers. Four years later, he had developed his songwriting ability. He went back to the CBC studios, this time with a band called the Teenage College Thrillers, and recorded two of his own original compositions that have gone on to become Bajan classics, namely, Goodbye Now, My Bajan Girl, and You Ain't Gonna Let Me Down. Thereafter, it was, as Lil Rick would say, recording hit after recording hit, right through the decade of the 1970s. You can make it if you try. Rock Steady Christmas, Love is a Hurting Thing, Any Day Now, Vehicle, Pretty Blue Eyes, I'm Free, Pity the Fool, You're Always Welcome Here, Never Do My Woman Wrong, The Best Part of My Day, and the list goes on and on. Richard Stout had become a Barbadian superstar performing as lead vocalist for such super groups as the organization, the Blue Rhythm Combo, the Troubadours, Flatbush, and often collaborating with Barbados' keyboard maestro, Lloyd Wilson Jr. But let me correct myself. Richard Stout was not only a Barbadian superstar, he was a Caribbean superstar. You see, back in the year 1970, there was a Caribbean-wide competition called the Caribbean Soul, King of Soul competition. Back then, Jackie Opel was the great soul singer of Barbados. 
and Jackie was invited to represent Barbados at that competition. But for some reason, Jackie decided that he wasn't going, and he arranged his, instead for his young protege, Richard Stout, to represent Barbados at the Caribbean Soul King competition. Richard went to St. Croix in the Virgin Islands, totally dominated the competition, and was crowned in 1970 Caribbean King of Soul. And brothers and sisters, I want, I want to make this clear, because, you know, when they talk about Richard Stout, they talk about teen talent, but there's something before teen talent. And I, I want to make this clear. Not only was Richard Stout first and foremost a soul singer, but Richard Stout was one of the world's greatest soul singers. Richard is right up there with the best of them. Otis Redding, Wilson Pickett, Sam Moore, Eddie Floyd, Jackie Opel, James Brown, Solomon Burke, Bobby Womack, and the list goes on. Go and listen to Pity the Fool. Go and listen to any of Richard's recordings and, uh, of the 1970s. This is one of the great, the world's great soul singers. He could match the best of them. Richard Stout was a master technician of a singer, blessed with impeccable timing and pitch, a master of the rare skill of being able at will to sing just ever so slightly and precisely behind the music. Very difficult technique to master. He also possessed a warm and engaging timbre in his voice. And the amazing thing is that even though soul music was his special love and forte, Richard excelled in a variety of genres. He was a first-class crooner and balladeer, a master of rhythm and blues, spooge and even calypso, and a wonderfully skilled interpreter of Caribbean island songs. That is Richard Stout. Unfortunately, that gig in St. Croix was the last favor Jackie was able to do for Richard because on the 9th of March, 1970, Jackie lost his life in a tragic car accident. Richard had lost his mentor and his hero. And in the years following Jackie's death, Richard determined that he was going to represent and keep alive Jackie's great musical gift to Barbados, spooge music. And Richard went on to represent Jackie's um, legacy by, re by recording Pretty Blue Eyes, My Girl, Vehicle Any Day Now, a whole host of spooge songs. And Richard must forever be highly praised for doing all that he possibly could to keep spooge music alive and for championing the legacy of Jackie Opel over the years. Um, I also want to make the point that Richard Stout, he, he had, a, he had a, a partnership with Satch Moore. Satch did, um, wrote many of his songs that Richard, Richard um, performed, but Richard Stout was also an outstanding songwriter in his own right. And I want to note that Richard composed such classics as Goodbye, Bajan Girl, What's the Use of Loving Somebody, Rock Steady Christmas, You Can Make It If You Try, You Ain't Gonna Let Me Down, Mr. Rich Man, and in more recent years, Stop the Abuse and Unity, which unfortunately the radio stations don't play. So many people probably don't know those two classics. Also of great significance, in the musical history of Barbados and Bajan's take note was Richard's 1983 25th anniversary live concert album recorded at the Holiday Inn 
before a packed audience of 1,500 seated, over 800 people on the beach who couldn't get in, and many boats filled with people. This is one of the world's, not the Caribbean's, this is the language I'm using. Go and listen to that album. This is one of the world's great life albums and should be played on the radio stations of Barbados. But let, let's go on to teen talent now, and I'll try to cover teen talent very quickly. Richard's life changed in around 1977 when he entered the corporate world in a sense. He entered the corporate world in that the Holiday Inn Hotel may, offered him the job of entertainment coordinator at the hotel. And his job was to develop the hotel's entertainment offerings. He tried to bring more locals into the hotel, but he also tried to provide avenues for local entertainers um, to, to perform at the Holiday Inn. And in 1977, and Richard tells the story, he said one night, a message came to him in a dream. And the message was, you, Richard Stout, you have to do something special for the young people of Barbados. He said he got this message. And that was the genesis of the Richard Stout Teen Talent Competition. He got this idea that he would establish this, um, this competition where young performers would receive training and valuable performing experience and that they would perform in the hotel for locals and tourists alike. And they would have the opportunity to be spotted by talent scouts from overseas, etc. And over the years, Richard developed a holistic philosophy for the teen talent competition. Over the years, he developed this idea that it would be much more than simply developing the youngsters' singing and performance abilities, but that it would extend to developing their minds and characters, instilling discipline and self-confidence, and helping them to develop a positive direction for their lives. And brothers and sisters, we speak loosely about a teen talent competition, but I want you to know that at the peak of its development, it actually comprised an under 12 competition, a teen talent competition, an over 21 competition, and also a competition for people with disabilities. Clearly, Richard Stout was not merely on an entertainment development mission. Rather, he was on a nation-building mission. Richard Stout was one of Barbados' preeminent nation-builders. He was a nation-builder, not just in entertainment, but it is still true to say that his institution made its biggest contribution to Barbados in the arena of unearthing and developing young artistic talents. And permit me to state for the record that Richard Stout Teen Talent Competition helped to discover, nurture, and develop such talents as Edwin Yearwood, Alison Hines, Rupi Clark, Adrian Clark, Hal Linton, Tamara Marshall, Anderson Blood Armstrong, Terencia Coward, Rosie Hunt, Ian Webster, Kareem Clark, Trinity Clark, William Classic Waith, Aziza Clark, Jan Gibson, Barry Chandler, Tony Norville, Johan J, Bruce Chandler, Wayne Daisley, Darren McCollin, Shante Aline Clark, Sharon Darlington, Shernell Anderson, Kim Derrick, Margaret Bovell, Lillian Lord, Lemuel Waith, Kimberly Innes, Romancia Murray, Carol Ann Scantlebury, Shadia Marshall, Betty Griffith Payne, Sky Dowridge, Diana Price, Kenya Joseph, Everdeen Smart, Ronnie Morris, Lisa Hackett, Tonisha Holder, Sharice Richards, Irvin Fatman Weeks, Brian Carter, Rashida Codrington, and the list goes on and on. 
Indeed, there was one year when eight of the ten finalists in the Pick or the Crop National Calypso Finals were graduates of the Richard Stout Teen Talent. <laughs> These artists and many more whose names I did not call constitute the living tissue of Richard Stout's profound and seminal contribution to our nation. Put simply, Richard Stout was a pillar of Barbadian music and entertainment. He was a pillar of Barbados' tourism industry and a pillar of our Crop Over Festival. Without Richard Stout's enormous contribution, the Barbados that we all live in today would be a significantly poorer society, both culturally and materially, and in its intangible spirit. Like the Roman poet Horace, Richard could justly proclaim, I have built a monument more lasting than bronze, higher than the pyramids' regal structures that no consuming rain nor wild north wind can destroy. And brothers and sisters, in the decades that follows, the 80s and 90s, Richard went on to make contributions on the Barbados Tourist Board, for example, on traveling to many countries doing promotions for Barbados' um, tourism. He made contributions in cricket, both as a, he had the record once of being the oldest debutant in Division I cricket in Barbados playing for Carlton in the Division I competition and captaining Carlton's Division II team. But his, the greatest gift that he gave to Barbados cricket was his son, Kevin. And I want to, I want to acknowledge how enlightened a man Richard was because Richard recognized early in Kevin's life, not only did Kevin have a passion for cricket, but he had a talent to match that passion. And when Kevin told Richard that he, Kevin, wanted to become a professional cricketer and to make cricket his career, Richard, just like how a father whose child says, whose child is an academic and wanted to make some academics study his career, he would do extra lessons and all the rest of it. Richard did all that was necessary for Kevin to be able to be constantly practicing his skill, honing his skill so that he could fulfill his dream of becoming um, uh, um, a professional, professional um, cricketer. And you, and, um, and you know something? Many Barbadians, myself included, felt that Kevin was... Richard felt it, I felt it, that Kevin was um, shabbily and unfairly treated by the cricketing authorities. And it caused, it caused Richard great pain because Richard often wondered whether it was because of him, because of him, Richard Stout, that his son was being treated. I mean, there was one year, 2012, when Kevin Stout, in the local T20 competition broke the batting record, went where no other Barbadian batsman had gone before, and they did not even invite him to the trials to try out for the national team. You break the record, but you can't even get into the trials to try out for the national team. And Richard wondered whether, are they, are they taking up you know, something on Kevin because of me? And, and Richard was right, because I overheard it myself. I overheard um, people high in the cricket um, um, fraternity saying, who Richard Stout think he is, that his son don't have to go and work a nine to five job like any other, like any other person. That's because Richard had invested in making sure that rather than having to go and work some nine to five job, Kevin was practicing his craft. And people who should know better, people who should know better held that against Richard. Imagine that. So, 
But Richard had so much pride in Kevin. And when Kevin was appointed Barbados captain, let me show you the metal of the man Richard stole. When Kevin was appointed Barbados captain, Richard took this so seriously. In fact, both Richard and Kevin took this national responsibility so seriously that Richard arranged for me to meet privately with Kevin, to introduce to Kevin C.L.R. James's literature and insights about the two greatest Barbadian cricket captains of all time, um, um, Sir Frank Worrell and Sir Garfield Sobers. And this, so that is how Richard thought. If Richard was doing, was committed to anything, he was going to give it his all. How many, how many other fathers of a, a newly appointed cricket captain would think, um, let me get somebody who could introduce him to the best West Indian literature about the greatest Barbadian cricket captains so that he could he could um, know those role models to follow. That was Richard Stout. That was Richard Stout. Yeah, I know. They're, they're telling me I have to wind up. They're telling me I have to wind up. But you see, when you're talking about the life of a great man, there is so much to be said. But I am going to wind up. You know what I'm going to wind up with? I am, go well, I'm going to, because we all heard about Richard as a, a one-man welfare agency. That is true. I witnessed that myself. But I am going to wind up with Richard Stout's actual words. I'm going to end with some of Richard's actual words. Words that he spoke to me and to the rest of Barbados more than once. But words that we perhaps didn't pay enough attention to. So let me end. Let, I want Richard to speak to you now. These are Richard's actual words. Number one, you need to give young people as many opportunities as possible and make them feel a part of life. Number two, we have to be more conscious of what is ours. Spooge is ours. Spooge music must be featured in the Crop Over Festival. Give Spooge music a chance to be recognized again. Number three, bring back entertainment to the hotels. Culture and tourism are our biggest assets, and they must be twinned. For example, the Calypso Monarch should be performing in the hotels of Barbados. Tourists must be able to experience him or her. Number four, we close down, we close down most of the venues that used to permit people to go out on weekends and dance and fraternize and bond with each other. Drill Hall, YMPC, Goodwill League, Queen's Park. And thus, lawlessness crept into our society. Number five, we lost these critical aspects of our culture because we, are, we opted to follow North America and forgot who we are. Number six, bring the people together in a love force with discipline and with, and with the knowledge that we black people are one people and must come together. Number seven, every radio station in Barbados should begin the day's programming by playing a version of beautiful Barbados so that they could identify who we are and start the day with positive thoughts of our country. A singer is a storyteller and an educator. Singers and songwriters, therefore, have a responsibility to spread positive and constructive messages. Take the well-known and popular entertainers into the troubled communities and let them mingle with the youth. Let them be positive role models to the youth and pass on advice and encouragement to the troubled youth. And finally, radio stations in Barbados should play 
100% Bajan music. Richard Dick Stout, you have left this earthly realm for higher duty with the almighty and ever-loving creator. But you will never be forgotten. Your spirit and legacy will live on forever in the hearts of our people and in the culture of our nation. May you rest in peace, my friend, and may light perpetual shine upon you. Thank you. Thank you. Following, we have two tributes, Ian Iweb Webster, and then of course you have the Dr. the Most Honorable Anthony Gabby Carter and Kenneth Walker. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Anybody can hear me? There are two things that Mr. Stout <clears throat> used to say to us at our workshops that really stuck with me through the years. One was that negatives are in pictures, but positives are in you. And then another thing that he would say <clears throat> is that if you come to the show and you don't sound good, at least look good. That was Richard's thought. And so I've tried in my own career to adopt some of that. And I want to say thanks to the Stout family for sharing Richard with us. And oh, my soul, so weary When troubles come And my heart burdened be Then I am still and waiting In the silence Until you come And sit a while
Good afternoon, I always say good afternoon, church. <coughs> Richard Dick Stout called me one morning, early laughing. I, I call him Aku. I say, Aku, what? Are you laughing so? I say, Garrett, man, I feel so good. What happened? Man, I got a hand on, say, a woman called me and tell me she and the children ain't eat for three days. I walk to the house and come back. I guess she's 75, I got 25. I said, but Aku, you supposed to carry me to lunch? Today, are you supposed to buy the lunch? You all have lunch? You will buy today, I will buy the next 10 days. <laughs> a great man. But he gave his first break. And I think the first person that saw the talent would have been the PM, because we went by her house at Christmas six years ago. And baby, see you are read. Because we're just told, used to say, time, Look, teach that little boy to read here. Teach you to read. I don't care what about this singing thing or that match. When he read, he can do all kinds of things in life. Anyhow, quickly, PM, baby, say, PM, um, I, would, I would like to um, get something to read. PM said, But I ain't got no children's books. The only book I got is this. You see what this is? And start to read. The PM had a spoon in her hand and drop it. She holler, Gabby, you know what they're reading? I said, no. That's Michael Manley's autobiography at six years old. Richard Stout encouraged me to get this boy to read. When you're ready, baby. On fully engaged since we born, playing a role that we've been given by the Creator who watches on. Sometimes it seems life is hard. Will receive only bad. Don't be afraid, don't give up the struggle. Keep your head high, you will get by, and, and you will be playing your role well. You will be. Of your 
your days as your setting sun. The Creator will say to you, Well done. Well done. Well done. Well done. Well done. Act to welcome. Sadness and bliss will be shared. Then suddenly things will get better. Don't be complacent. See the future. Save all you can. Fill your need. But don't ever sow. Seas of green. Love your neighbor as you love your person. Life will be complete. Life will be sweet. And you will be playing your role well. You will be a Of your days at your setting sun, the Creator will say to you, Well done, well done, well done, well done, well time creeping on down the line don't be ashamed when you no longer can run the moon like youngsters do mm -hmm. show them the ways all the walls help them avoid Life's pitfalls, helping them through, is really helping your own offspring do the same thing, and you will be playing your role well, you, you will be a voice. At the end of your days, as your setting sun, the Creator will say to you, Well done, well done, well done, well done. Aku, you know I will. Always love you, Aku. It was you, it was you who teach me my first first song. You showed me right from wrong, how to phrase properly, how to sing for this country. We went to school together in all kind of weather. You teach me how to dress, how to try to be the best, and so I watch you here. I'm fighting hard not to shed a tear, but I'll always remember you. I'll always remember you, my good friend Richard Stout Dick. Whom we call a cool. Well done. Well done. Well done. Well done. Well done. Well done.
friends to leave. Thank you, Prime Minister, and your team. Appreciate your presence. Well done. Well done, well done. I'm just staying. We have our Bible reading. Please stand with us. Shall Waterman is going to read for us. After Shall reads, we have a special rendition by Sheldon. Oh, and then Reverend Anderson Kelman would speak for us. He would be pastor of the deceased, which is stout. So, Cheryl? Ben Sheldon, and the next person would, have be, would be the speaker. Once Cheryl has read, you will resume your seats, okay? Cheryl? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My scripture reading is from Revelation 22, verse 1 to 8. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal. Proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yield her fruits every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no night there, and they need no candles, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they reign forever and ever. And he said unto them, These saints are faithful and truth. The Lord God of the holy prophets send his angels and shew unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the saying of the prophecies of this book. And I saw John saw these things and heard them. And when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angels which shew me those things. Here end of the lesson. Certainly it's my honor to have this opportunity to lend my voice to this great man. I stand in a dual role, having served as the chief judge for this competition for many years. And Mr. Stout entrusted that under my care. And the one thing I will tell you about Mr. Stout, he never got involved with the judges. Not that he always agreed with our decision, but he never got involved. And certainly on the behalf of the minister in the prime minister's office culture, Senator Dr. Chantal Monroe Knight, my chairman, Dr. Jasmine Babb, and the entire board of directors of the National Cultural Foundation, our CEO, Ms. Carol Roberts, her management team, and the entire staff of the National Cultural Foundation, we extend to the family our sincerest condolences. Mr. Stout has served well, and I pray that this song will be a blessing to you. The timeless theme, earth and heaven will pass away. It's not a dream. God will make all things new that day. Gone is 
the curse from which I stumbled and fell. Evil is banished to each no hate. and peace be unto you. I know that the time is far spent and uh, therefore I would just want to share a few very quick thoughts with you as relates to my friend and, and brother Richard. First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 9 to the to verse 12, talks about living well. And I'm sure that as you've heard the commendations and the wonderful things which which has done, the legacy he has left, I'm sure we all would, uh, would agree that Richard has lived well. And I want to suggest this afternoon even as we talk about his legacy, I want to suggest, I want to urge that that which he has started will be continued. I want to urge you that 
that which Richard has begun in terms of, of the teen talent competition will continue in the future that many more persons will be given a chance at maximizing and optimizing their talent. And so he lived well because he loved others. Thessalonians tells us that living well has to do with having brotherly love, has to do with being able to support and encourage one another. As I have, over the last two years, journeyed with Richard, I observed the immense love which he's had for everyone. There was never a time in Richard's presence where one did not feel a sense of, of welcome. He loved others. But the second point to Thessalonians is not just loving others, but loving God as well. And Richard loved his God. As a matter of fact, and I think Ambassador Common Song, he said it, whenever we went to Richard's bedside to, to minister to him, we got ministered to. Because he would always say to me, Pastor, God is in control. Whenever I, I sat with him or, or spoke to him, he would say, Pastor, don't worry. God has it under wraps. I am his son. He will take care of me. He loved others, and he loved his God. And so, because he made his calling and election sure, Richard died with a blessed hope. As a matter of fact, the text tells us that on that final day, that the trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And those who are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet our Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with our Lord. So those who live well, they also die well. And so our dear brother, he's gone from us. He has left a glory legacy. But we have the confidence for the hallmark of the Christian experience is the bodily resurrection of the saints. We have the assurance that this is not the end. For one day, we shall see our brother face to face in that new Jerusalem because he died with that blessed hope, that hope in Jesus Christ. And so I want to challenge us this afternoon. I want us to remember all the things that Richard represented. And I believe that God loves us into our lives to teach us important lessons. I believe that God sets persons in our lives so that they can enrich us as we continue. And there are three things I want to share very, very briefly with Richard. The first thing is this, that Richard was a man who was committed to excellence. Whatever he did, he did well. Secondly, he understood the value of giving back. He had a social conscience. He recognized that, that, that once he admitted to, to, to the talk, he had to, to, to bring others along with him. He didn't kick another down. He invited others to come and to be a part of his, of his journey. He had a social conscience. And thirdly, he had an abiding faith in Jesus Christ. And so today, as I challenge you, allow those things that Richard has taught us to enrich us so that our lives can be stronger for having met the man who lay here, but who one day will stand face to face with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God bless you. God bless him. And may the soul of our departed brother, may his soul rest in peace, and may it rise in victory. Hallelujah.
Bless the Lord. Just stop with me very quickly. We're gonna, we're gonna move very, very, very quickly now. We 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 have quite some quick sometime. And um, my my wife only gave me a, a two-hour pass, so I'm in trouble. So please start with me as we say a special prayer for the family, and then we'll be out of here and we'll all get to the cemetery. This is Robert Marina Taylor. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene, and I wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. That's what my brother would be saying today if he was able to, to, to share with us. And as we pray, God, and we bring our brother's family before you, we thank you, gracious God, that you are a wonderful God. You are a loving God. You are gracious and full of mercy. And God, in your word, you says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And even today, God, though we may be feeling a sense of loss and, and pain and sorrow, but God, deep in our hearts, God, we know that you are with us. That God, it doesn't matter what we go through because you have promised that you are our refuge and our strength. Our very present help in our time of trouble. Oh God, when we are going through the valleys of the shadow of death, when we are going through rough times, God, and when those who, who we love has left us, God, there leaves us an emptiness and a void. But God, you are the God who fills our hearts with your peace. And I pray, God, that you would rest and remain with the family. And may the peace of God that, that sheds abroad in our hearts fill their hearts, oh God, today. And Lord, even as during the still hours of the night, God, they would remember their father, their grandfather, their uncle, whoever ever he might have been to them, Lord God. Lord, even as they would shed the tears, I pray, Father, that your arms of love would embrace them, Heavenly Father. You would comfort them because you are the God of all comfort. And Father, that you would help them to know that you care about them and you love them. And Lord, you would dry the tears from their eyes. So I pray, Father, that you would rest upon them. Your presence and your peace would be theirs. And oh God, even as they would continue to the legacy that their, their father would have left and their loved ones would have left that God, that their desire would be to, to love the God that Richard loved and in one day father that they will see him again and be in peace with him. So father we thank you and we praise you cover them I pray with the blood of Jesus and may the angels of the Lord encamp around them in Jesus name I pray with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. Standing for our final hymn, Angels' Voices Ever Singing. It's the last song, so let's pillow all stops and let's really sing depths of our heart.
his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Trampling down death by death and giving life to those in the tomb. The Son of Righteousness is gloriously risen, giving light to those who sat in darkness and in the shadow of death. The Lord will guide his feet into the way of peace, having taken away the sin of the world. Christ will open the kingdom of heaven to those who believe in his name, saying, Come, O blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. Into paradise may the angels lead you. At your coming, may the martyrs receive you and bring you into the holy city, Jerusalem. And so we conclude this funeral service for a man who was simply a conduit through which others would shine in the words of our Prime Minister. Richard Stout. The godfather of entertainment in Barbados. The procession will make its way to the Westbury Cemetery for the private interment. I'm sure with Mikowski. Good afternoon.